Welcome to Luke 418 Radio. You're listening to The Dove. I am your host, Kenneth Ramsby. I would like to welcome each and every one of you. I hope your life is enhanced by the word of God we share here on The Dove. Come with me as we receive inspiration to our hearts for life. Hello, Dove Show listeners. To begin today's show, I would like to read from the book of Luke, chapter 12, verse 15. And the word of God reads, And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the thing he possesses. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I pray for an increased anointing and a greater grace, and that your Holy Spirit guides my mind, my will, my intellect, my emotions, and my body each day. Let me be a tool in your hand, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Today's show is titled, Are You Transformed? What is transformation? Transformation, according to Webster's, is a thorough or dramatic change in form or appearance. The question I want to ask each person that's listening right now is this. Have you been transformed as a follower of Christ? You know, we say that we are Christians. We say that we are followers of Jesus Christ. But are we? Or is it just lip service that we're giving? I don't know. I'm just asking. At first, you know, we find ourselves going down a path in life that gets us bound up. And although we go to church and pray, sometimes just to get out of tight spots. That's what we do. And you know it. We get bound up and we go to church and we pray when we're in trouble. That's what many of us do. We start seeking God more and more over time, and then we hit a point where we decide to give our life to Christ fully. That's what we're saying. So we go to church nervously and are sitting in church, right? So as the service goes on and, and we say, okay, we got, I'm going to give my life to Christ and I'm going to do all of this. Woo-hoo. Yes, today is the day. And we're sitting there nervously in church. So as the service goes on, we get really nervous as the pastor winds up, as most do, especially in Southern Baptist churches. You know, right towards the end, oh, he gets wound up all right. (laughs) And that's why I was raised up in Southern Baptist, and that's what they do. You hear the call to go down front. When the pastor says that the doors to the church are open for those who want to dedicate their life to Christ and be baptized along with the right hand of fellowship. And for those who want to join the church as an already professed Christian. So you get up and you feel all the eyes turning to you and you hear clapping as you walk down to the front of the pulpit and are seated in a chair waiting for others to do the same. You are then asked why you came down. You state that you are there to give your life to Christ and be baptized along with joining the church. You are told to repeat after the pastor accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, as it says in John 3, 16, that God sent his only son and that you believe that God raised him from the dead on the third day, as stated in John 3, 16. Then you are told on the first Sunday to return to church as you will be baptized then. You remain standing in front as the service ends and wait as members of the church come and give you the right hand of fellowship by shaking your hand and doing an initial welcoming as brothers of and sisters. The first Sunday comes and there you are standing in line to get baptized. 
you are nervous, but confident as you are immersed in baptism and water and begin your walk as a servant of Christ. You have been baptized in water and you have said the prayer stating you will follow God's word and be his disciple. At first, right after you get baptized and accept Jesus Christ as your savior, you read the Bible more than you have ever have. You pray more than you ever have every night, especially when things are going bad in your life. You tell yourself this, self, I am now saved and do this because this is what I was told by the church I belong to. And I've heard the same thing for many years. That's what Christians do. So let's see what the Bible says about how those who have said they dedicate their life to Christ and a Christian should live. So here it is. Let's see if we are truly a Christian and have had a transformation in our life and are we just using uh, lip service, I will say, that we are Christians but not living as one. It's only one way or the other. Either you've been transformed or you haven't. First, have you been transformed as a Christian and are filled with God's love? You know, we hate to admit it, but many of us struggle daily to put God first in our life, even after knowing how much he loves us, as stated in John 3, 16. How faithful God is, despite all sins, as we read in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, which reads, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful, he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. And also how God has made us his child in John 1, 12 through 13. It states this, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. So even after just these three things that God is faithful in, many of us do not place God first in our lives, but yet call ourselves Christians. So, have you been transformed as a Christian? And are you filled with God's love? I'm just asking. The secondly, have you been transformed as a Christian and have genuine salvation? If you do, you certainly love Father God more than the world, as the Bible reads in 1 John 2, 15 through 17, which states, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. If you do love the Lord, then you will do as it states in Luke 10, 27. And it states this, and he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. If you love God more than you love the world, then you will also follow the words of 1 John 4, 7 through 8, which says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. So do you love God more than you love the world? I'm just asking. That fancy car you have. That nice house you have, those grown children you have that you always put in front of everything in your life 
Ask yourself this. Do you care enough about each of these things that if you lost them, would it change your life? Or will you take it to the Lord and let him carry your losses and depend on him to carry you through and not care if you have these things or not? And yes, that includes losing those grown children out of your life as well. Trusting God to carry you through a physical or mental loss you may have with them. Sometimes you have to let the chicks lead the nest to grow on their own. If you have raised them the way God says to raise your children, your trust in God will be enough to know that they will be all right and not you fixing things every time they call them growing up children you got. Oh, man, they do that. So have you been transformed as a Christian and have genuine salvation? I'm just asking. Third, have you been transformed as a Christian and hate sin? When you transform and born again, you hate sin. In Psalm 97.10, the word of God reads this. Let those who love the Lord hate sin. One of the clear signs of a true Christian is that they hate sin. A healthy Christian can usually identify negative habits and get rid of them because they know sin is a kind of evil. So, do you still use curse words when you get mad? I'm just asking. You do know that curse words place curses, right, Christians? Do you tell others to not use the Lord's name in vain as a cuss word as it bothers you so? I'm just asking, do you? Do you still look at a person up and down that looks or smells nice and in your mind or out loud think or say, dang, they fine, or tell your friends, girl, he looks good. If it was not for me being married, I would crawl all over that. As the transformed Christians, I am sure you do know that <laughs> sin of lust is a sin, right? You don't do that anymore. I am quite sure being the astute Christian that you are, right? You don't lust. In simple terms, the lust of the eyes is the sinful desire to possess what we see or to have those things which have visual appeal. These also include covenant of money, possessions, or other physical things, and it's not from God, but from the world around us. Lust of the eyes or of the flesh is not what a transformed Christian would ever do. Those that like sin and have said that they are Christians will tell you that Jesus was the only person that walked on earth without sin. You probably heard that before, which is true and fact. But they will go on to say, God knows my heart. Or God is working on me. When I hear this, I think about the old me that used to say it as well. <laughs> I used to say it as an excuse to justify my sinning. As I would be planning another bout of sin in my subconscious at the same time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Say the same thing. Many of you know what I'm talking about. God knows my heart. God is working on me. I'm steady out there sinning. Most people are doing the same. Planning the next collection of wages to put in their bank account in heaven, just adding up their wages of sin, that equals death. Many have died in their sins with their last words of stating God's still working on me, or God knows my heart, or I'm trying and I'm not there yet. God understands. <laughs> We have to stop sinning and stop placing excuses on God, expecting him to make us stop sinning. 
We have to take the first steps, just like when we said we would give our life to Christ when we took that first step. You can stop sinning if you want to. Be like the slogan, just do it. Those that have the Holy Spirit inside have help in their first step and afterwards. It is called faith and trust in the Lord to carry you through those weak moments when sin comes a flirting. Those who have been transformed don't willfully sin anymore. So have you been transformed as a Christian and don't willfully sin anymore? I'm just asking. Fourth, a true believer practices patience. Ecclesiastes 7 8 reads, The end of the matter is better than its beginning, and patience is better than pride. When was the last time you as a saved Christian hollered at a person in front of you in your mind or out loud saying something like this? I wish they would hurry up and pay for their things. Dang, they slow. People like that shouldn't even come in the store anymore. Why don't they just order delivery from Target or Uber Eats or DoorDash or HelloFresh or somewhere? Or say something like this. When was the last time you said something or thought something like this? When was the last time you told your spouse or kids, why don't you lift the toilet seat before you use it? Or why don't you at least clean up after yourself? And it, all these things you said turned into a big fight. And you know they would because they ain't the first time you said them. You should have said, instead did this. Check it out. You should have prayed that you be the change and be patient and clean up after others, regardless of what mess they make and how many times they make it. Tell them with love when they repetitiously say they're going to change and do stuff like clean up after themselves and they don't. Hollering and screaming ain't going to get nothing. It ain't going to get nothing but make things a little worse and have animosity in your household. And the devil is waiting to have an open door for that. I look at it like this. Be a servant like Jesus was. You say you're a follower of Christ, right? Well, you have to follow him in all his ways and not pick and choose. You should be just like Jesus in the book of John, chapter 13, verses 14 through 17, which Jesus says this. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Verily, truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Mm. So do you want to be blessed? <laughs> yeah, if you do, humble yourself and clean up after others just like Jesus washed his disciples' feet, especially for the things you don't care to do. God is true to his word. He'll bless you. So have you been transformed as a Christian and have patience and do things for others that most will not do? Hmm. I'm just asking. Five. Live a holy life. A follower of Jesus' life will be morally pure. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 states this. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. A child of God will flee from immorality. 
It is not challenging for someone to live for Jesus if he is morally and spiritually pure. As a transformed Christian, you must run from sin in the opposite direction. It is easier to run towards sin than away from it. It is a natural thing for our hearts to desire to run towards sin and not away from it. It's easy to run towards sin and harder to run away. There are many examples in the Bible of people who choose to embrace sin like jealousy, pride, lust, and anger instead of God. In the end, their decisions always lead to suffering and separation from God. Run away, I say. So what if you look like you are a chicken of standing toe to toe with Jezebel as she come towards you with all her business hanging out? He or she comes straight towards you to tell you to come and have pleasure with him or her. You know the type. Ain't nothing wrong with running. <laughs> be chicken. <laughs> be chicken from standing toe to toe. No, she does not care that you marry. Mm -hmm. She does not care if your kids are with you. She just wants you to fall off that Jesus train just for a little while. Remember this, the devil and his minions, oh, they have had thousands of years to practice deceit and trickery on man. And Jezebel is the trickiest. The devil just wants to get us to sin just for one second with lust, desire, covetousness, fornication, adultery, and any other sin he could possibly get us to do. Know this, that in the spirit realm, there is a familiar spirit who knows everything about you. Mm -hmm. From the time you was born to now, he been following you around. You ain't know it, did you? This spirit has been following you around your whole life. And this spirit's job is to get you to go down a path of the world, the path of sinful behavior. I'm going to put it like this. You know, you've seen the little cartoons, right, where someone is, is thinking about doing something and the little angel pops up on one shoulder and the little devil pops up on the other shoulder and one of the devil is whispering in the ear something and then the angels whispering in the ear don't do that, right? It's the same way. That little devil follow you around. The spirit, We're talking about the spirit realm now. Why do you think when people go to palm readers and psychics, they hear everything about their lives and they know everything. They know your dog that died 10 years ago, know the name of that. They know your auntie and they know your grandma. They know everything about you. Why do you think they know that? That evil spirit that uses people as psychics is called a familiar spirit. And so if we are deceived for just one second, that is all it takes. One second of lust. And that is just as bad as one hour of lust. A sin is a sin. And you have to repent for even that one second of that old person creeping up that Jezebel brought forward from the old days with a whole nasty self. So, have you been transformed as a Christian and live a morally pure, sin-free life? I'm just asking. These were just five of the ways we should live as a follower of Christ. And many can't or won't even live the way God says we must live as followers of Christ. They say it, but they don't live it. So let me ask you this. As a Christian, do you live according to the word of God or do you live according to the word of the world? There's no middle ground. Being filled with God's love, having genuine salvation, hating sin, practicing patience, and moral living are just five ways of many that as a follower of Christ, God expects us to adhere by and live by according to his will for our lives. My dear friends, we must trust in the Lord with all our hearts and lean not 
unto our own understanding of things. God is here for all who seek him. You know, the choice is yours, heaven or hell. We all have a date that only God knows the appointed time of. This is one appointment that none of us are going to miss. This appointment right here, you won't be running late for, I guarantee you. This appointment right here, you won't be calling in, asking to change it. The Bible says this in Acts 17, 32, 31. God commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. If you have not given your life to Christ yet, why don't you do it today? God is waiting to shower you with his righteous blessings for your life. Oh, my friends, you will not be disappointed. Listen, God loves each and every one of you, and I don't want anyone not to have a chance for eternal life in heaven and be caught short at the end of their days. You have to turn your lives around now and be bold in stepping out in faith and trusting in the Lord. We must obey God's commands and seek his wonderful gifts above all else in our lives. He will lead us down the path that is righteous. Look, if you have not, why don't you give your life to Christ today? Tomorrow might not come. Look, you could, if you want to, you can go to Luke418church.com and click the link to join us as an online member. Also, for deliverance, you can reach out to the Luke 418 Counseling Center by visiting www.luke418church.org. Scroll down the prayer request section, then send a message with your name and email to request counseling. Or you can call the Luke 418 Counseling Center for deliverance at area code 951 901-402-8530. I repeat, you can call the Luke 418 Counseling Center for Deliverance at area code 951-402-8530. I speak blessings to each listener and pray that your home be filled with the Holy Spirit. May the Lord also quench and crush every dart the devil may sin. May the Spirit of the Lord bless you and your family. Let the Lord's gifts of peace, love, joy, good health, and prosperity be upon you in accordance to the riches in God's glory and will for your life. I want to thank each and every one of you for listening to the Dove Show today on Luke418radio.com, which is the leading cutting edge in Christian radio on the Internet. I sincerely hope that something was said on today's show that encourages and leads you to make a decision to give your life to Christ today. Join me again, my friends, next week. For part two of Are You Transformed? May the Lord bless you and keep you and your family. Until next time, this is your host, Kenneth Ramsby. May peace be with you. You've been listening to The Dove on Luke 418 Radio. Join us next week as we share God's word. Download the Luke 418 radio app from your app store. Be sure to tune in daily to Luke418radio.com. Be sure to share the podcast on your favorite social media channel. 